Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcoming, I would just like to welcome everybody both in the room uh, as well as uh, on the phone in, in the webinar space uh, to what is the first sci-fi seminar series session for 2018. And uh, today it is Navigating Uncharted Territory, the Experience of Public Health Inspectors in Clinical IPAC Audits. So my name is David Riding, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's call. And uh, just as a reminder, we'll remain in lecture mode for the duration of the call. Um, so if you have any questions uh, uh, throughout the call or the talk, please do send them through the chat pod, which is located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and so, yeah, I, without further ado, I think I'm going to uh, introduce our, our – we have three presenters today, so I'll just do a, a quick uh, introduction of them and then hand over the mic for their presentation. So uh, starting off uh, presenting is Jennifer Snow. Uh, Jennifer is a certified public health inspector working in the city of Hamilton's public health services, where she is the supervisor of the infectious disease program. Jennifer recently completed her Master of Public Health degree at the University of Waterloo. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Arts uh, honorary degree from the University of Toronto and a Bachelor of Applied Science in Public Health from Ryerson University. Jennifer received her certification as a public health inspector in 2009. Prior to that, she worked in public health research. Uh, her professional interests include infection prevention control, epidemiology, and public health policy. So welcome, Jennifer. Uh, we also have Crystal Hendry. Uh, so Crystal has specialized in infection prevention and control for most of her career as a, public, as a certified public health inspector with a diverse experience in both urban and rural settings. She's uh, been employed with Hamilton Public Health Services for the past six years on the infectious disease team. She earned her Bachelor of Health Science from Western University and Bachelor of Applied Science in Public Health and Safety from Ryerson. And our third speaker is Jane Lee. Uh, so Jane has always had an interest in, in health and science. Prior to becoming a certified public health inspector in 2006, she earned her Master's of Science from the University of Toronto and worked in cancer research. She has been employed with Hamilton Public Health Services for 11 years, the majority of which has been spent specialized in infection prevention and control. So welcome our three presenters, and I'd like to hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so this is our disclosure that we have no uh, conflict of interest at all. And um, so today, just for our presentation, um, we'll just do a little bit of a background um, on uh, IPAC uh, and the lapse disclosure uh, that uh, came out from the ministry back in uh, 2015. And um, talking a little bit about how we established the whole program within the health unit, um, preparing um, for the IPAC lapse investigations, as well as some internal IPAC audits that we did within our own health unit. And then we'll talk, uh, Crystal and Jane will talk a little bit about the experience um, of being a PHI working in the program um, and conducting these audits and doing these IPAC lapse investigations. And then finally, um, I just wanted to, I'll come back onto the mic and just talk a little bit about takeaways um, from our experiences in Hamilton, as well as some future considerations, not only for our health unit, but also for the, um, for the province um, in general and, and uh, for certified public health inspectors. So I think uh, everyone's probably familiar uh, with these uh, documents, although there's been some updates since the 2015 one, the protocol. Um, and so this came out, I'm sure, as a lot of people recall, back in the fall of 2015, um, when it came from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And, um, and when this came out, there were uh, a lot of questions um, about how we were going to take this on, uh, specifically within Hamilton as a department. Um, and so really trying to figure out what this was going to involve. And so I took on the role of um, acting manager of the infectious um, disease prevention and control team back in um, the beginning of 2016. And so part of my role in taking this on was looking at you know, how we were going to establish a process to both receive and respond um, to these complaints when they began to come in. And, and really also uh, a big part of that was also considering our, our capacity and our abilities um, to be able to do this, to do this work. So um, part of the consideration of the department as a whole was really looking at the structure of the department and, and how we were going to establish this process, you know, who were going to be the best folks within the health unit um, to do the work, 
um, and also looking at what the role of our departmental infection control practitioner was going to be, which is, um, as I'm sure all the health units know, is a fully funded position by the Ministry of Health, and yet traditionally wasn't one that does investigations or, or inspections um, in, in that role. So, so where would the ICP fit in here? Um, but a big part of the discussions came down to the um, to the health inspectors and, and their role in, in doing this. And Hamilton considered um, the health inspectors to really be a core component of doing these IPAC labs investigations um, for a number of reasons, which I think you can see here on the slide. Um, basically, it's the skills of the inspectors, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Um, their qualifications, and obviously um, the powers of um, health inspectors uh, in, in the ability to, for instance, um, issue closure orders, um, health hazard orders, etc. But at the same time, we were really recognizing that this was um, uncharted territory, which is in the title of our presentation. Um, this is very new um, for the health unit in, in terms of us having to work with and go out and deal with regulated health professionals, which had really previously been always kind of a, a no-go uh, area of sorts. So what we had to really do next is start considering um, the investigation team, who was going to take this on um, within the health unit, um, which inspectors were going to do this. Um, so considerations that we looked at um, from a management sort of perspective, we're looking at workloads um, of the teams um, who had expertise and experience. Um, and so really what it was determined was given the role of the infectious disease prevention and control PHIs, um, they really probably had the most expertise and the, and the best experience to be able to take on this role. And um, I'll get into uh, a little bit in the next slide or two in terms of what, what this team sort of took on. But, um, but we also had to consider workloads. Um, and so part of that and part of a plan um, that was um, devised by the director and the um, associate medical officer of health was in mid-2016, um, we gave a number of the reportable diseases that uh, these inspectors managed, and we handed it over to sort of the public health nursing side um, of our ID team um, for that case management. And really, this was a part of a strategy to handle the imminent demands around IPAC lapses. So also, um, within the first month, I, we, I had a meeting um, with my staff to sort of talk about this because the department had determined that our team was going to take this on. So um, we had some people um, that were interested in, in, um, in the role of IPAC lapses, and so they were sort of volunteered um, unwittingly to, to take this on. But also at the same time, um, the folks who volunteered for this, including Crystal and Jane who are presenting today, um, really had the other skills that we really needed to look at and consider for these investigations, which included um, high, high level of communication skills, um, which I think a majority of uh, certified health inspectors have, um, just based on the nature of the work of going out, um, dealing with a lot of different contentious issues, um, providing a lot of education in the community on public health, and so it was a really great fit that way. And the folks um, in particular on the team um, are, are very skilled at that. Um, in addition, they also have um, ex exceptional skills in risk, as risk assessment. Um, and again, that's another huge part of the role of a, of a health inspector um, that I think is kind of outstanding and, and unique um, about certified inspectors is those risk assessment skills that we do in our work every single day uh, going out for inspections. Um, and again, that interest. So those folks that stuck up their hand that they were interested to participate in developing a program for IPAC lapses and got pulled into this. Um, but the other thing I considered was the professionalism. Um, there's a great deal of sensitivity around the work that's being conducted with these IPAC lapse investigations and the disclosure, um, which I think the uh, majority of health units on the line can really appreciate um, what this takes. Um, when you're going out and doing this, and we're really, um, I and mean, we always sort of deal as, as inspectors with people's livelihoods and their businesses, um, but these these roles could have a huge, huge impact um, on on the folks that we're going out and investigating, and so we really had to have that level of professionalism and expertise. So, um, decision was made to take on three PHIs um, from the infectious disease team to start. Um, in these investigations. And then we also did decide to pull in our ICP, who's also a nurse practitioner, um, to be a part of, of this. Um, so Janice Fackelman is our ICP at Hamilton Public Health. So it was decided by the AMOH, the director and myself, that um, the ICP would attend all of the investigations that we received, all the complaints. She would go out along with at least one PHI to do these investigations. 
And the reason we decided on that was we thought it was a really good mix of professionals um, that had that IPAC knowledge, um, but also they had the strong clinical skills, um, especially with Janice also being a nurse practitioner, um, as well as the strong risk assessment skills that really came from those inspectors and their experience. So um, this is the team. So we're now, we had a restructuring in Hamilton back in early uh, February 2017. Um, and so we were formerly the infectious disease uh, prevention and control team, but we are now the infectious diseases team. So we are made up of both PHIs and uh, PHNs um, who do the ID work. But for back in 2016, um, the team was made up of 11 PHIs, and the portfolio um, you can see listed here was both outbreak management. Um, we did a number of um, reportable case management, um, and as I said earlier, we cut that back um, in uh, 2016 to help accommodate for these IPAC lapse investigations. And so, mainly case management now for the um, for the inspectors is mostly enteric um, diseases um, and, a, and a few others. Um, they also do the personal service settings inspections, which is a really good match for the IPAC labs uh, investigations, uh, as well as licensed bee nursery inspections um, and, and general IPAC education as a part of their role. So initially, again, we had the three PHIs that were chosen to lead the IPAC lapses. Currently at this moment, um, we have five um, PHIs along with our ICP that are responding to these complaints when they come in. So um, this did not come without its concerns. Um, so we really had to look at preparing the team for our IPAC work. Um, and again, we use that term uncharted territory because this was very, very new. And the PHIs were um, vocal, which I appreciated on their concerns, um, specifically around the clinical work um, that we would be going out and observing and, and investigating, um, and their ability to be able to assess the risk in these settings. Um, I had every confidence um, in the team and, and the inspectors in being able to do um, a really qualified and thorough risk assessment, um, but completely understood um, their hesitation and, and concerns, and, and this was very new. Um, so what we, one thing that we did do to start, and one thing I did was contacted Public Health Ontario for assistance and just sort of asked what could they provide us um, to help the staff in getting prepared for these. So our IPAC Central West folks came out and they provided a really good presentation to staff on clinical IPAC issues. Um, so it was a great presentation, um, but again, there was still that hesitation and concern about going out into the field and again into something that could be potentially a contentious situation. Um, this is very new also for the regulated health professionals and many of them, despite our communications, uh, weren't really aware of this new process that came from the Ministry of Health. And so, um, you know, the, the other concern was that the team was maybe worried they were going to go out there, maybe not know exactly what they were looking at, and potentially looking inadequate in front of the health professional, and then having their qualifications and their skills being questioned. Um, so again, I think that they had excellent risk assessment and research skills, but again, when you're being confronted right there and then in a situation, it's a whole different story. And so um, those, those hesitations were completely uh, understandable. So ideally, um, I think staff really wanted hands-on training um, before they were venturing out on these complaints. So um, as it turned out, around the same time, um, our Associate Medical Officer of Health at the time, Dr. Jessica Hopkins, um, sort of approached me and discussed with me a new initiative. Um, the involvement of the regulated health professionals um, in this new IPAC labs uh, document was a new component and one that really got her thinking about our own clinical services within Hamilton Public Health. Um, and how would we manage if we received an IPAC complaint um, about one of our services? How would that look for the city if we needed to post um, an IPAC lapse on our disclosure page? Um, you know, that, that's really about looking at that risk management component and also embarrassing um, if we're going out there and doing that enforcement and yet internally uh, we're not following our own rules, um, you know, throwing stones and glass houses and everything. So, um, so how could we be proactive so that we're leading by example in the community? And that was really our goal. Um, and so this really led to the decision to conduct audits of public health services, cl um, clinical services, of which we have a number. And so you can see listed here on the slide, um, we had decided to do audits of our sexual health clinics, our dental clinics. Um, we both have an, a large internal uh, dental clinic uh, that operates in our building, um, but we also go out into the community because Hamilton is rather large geographically. Um, and then we have our dental bus. Um, we do quite a bit of reprocessing for our dental services, so looking at that, looking at our vaccine preventable disease team and their clinics they have for vaccines, um, breastfeeding clinics, um, as well as our harm reduction. So 
um, this is another thing to prepare for, is really looking at the audits. And so it was very important for me to distinguish and to be clear with the team, and it was the three PHIs in our ICP that were going to be doing these audits, um, that it was very clear on what the difference was between an audit versus an inspection. And um, the team got a pretty quick understanding of, of those differences and what that meant. Um, but it was not only important for me to communicate that to the team, but also to communicate that to our clinical services folks. Um, I'm sure uh, all the inspectors online can kind of appreciate that sometimes we're viewed um, a bit harshly in terms of our enforcement measures and that we're often punitive um, in the nature of the work that we do, which can be true. Um, but there is another component of our work, which is really about education. And that was really the goal of these audits. It was not to be punitive. It was not to come down and lay the hammer. Um, it was really to work with our colleagues um, on, on getting things in order and making sure that we were, um, again, leading by example for the community. So, um, so there were communications uh, with the teams that I went out and did with all of our clinical services teams and getting that message across. Also, with our own team, we started looking at um, a really great uh, series that was published in the Canadian Journal of Infection Control, which I recommend everyone take a look at, um, basically on the IPAC audit process. So it's a three-part series. Um, that was written, and that was really quite helpful. Um, also, of course, um, a really serious review of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care document on uh, the uh, last disclosure, uh, the guidance document, I should say. But the other thing about these audits, what we really saw was a twofold benefit. Um, obviously, I've already spoken to this, but it really reduced the risk to the corporation. Uh, so the city of Hamilton is a corporation. And so it was, um, it was a risk management component to it. But it also provided that training and that experience um, that the inspectors and our ICP were looking for um, on clinical setting investigations and inspections. Even though this is an audit, um, it could still be very beneficial education-wise. So it allowed for that opportunity to become familiar also with the tools that PHO um, had brought out, the clinical office um, checklist uh, that had just come out actually just prior to our inspections, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and again, it was a mutually beneficial relationship um, between the ID staff doing the investigations as well as our clinical services staff to help increase their IPAC knowledge and to know what was best practice. Um, and uh, Jane and Crystal will speak a little bit about um, their experiences in terms of uh, working with these clinical services folks in, in our department on IPAC and, and their levels of knowledge. So again, it satisfied that want for hands-on learning. Um, they were a collegial effort to assist both sides, as I mentioned. Um, again, the audit team provided that IPAC education, and the clinical teams assisted the PHIs and the ICP in some cases in learning clinical procedures. And this was really especially important um, around dental clinics, which at the time we didn't know how hot the dental uh, sort of issue would become. Um, but really there was little to no familiarity within um, public health other than within our dental team around uh, the processes used in these clinics. But uh, it didn't come without its challenges. Um, we did have to limit the number of auditors in the clinic due to space, um, basic clinic functioning. Um, there's the observation of procedures um, we had some challenges with. Again, Jane and Crystal will speak to this. Um, and, and that has to do with sort of the comfort and the privacy of clients that were being seen in these clinics uh, when we were in there. Um, but we did want to ensure that each PHI was able to experience similar audits. Um, so, for example, they all took part in some aspect of, um, of the dental audits. Um, and then we also had to look at rolling this out to the larger group of PHIs within the ID team, and, and that was a challenge as well, uh, given those limitations. And at the time, this was in the summer of 2016, um, we had really had to look at choosing the right tools for auditing. Um, but uh, we were quite lucky. Um, the PHO released the uh, IPAC checklist right around the time that we were beginning those audits, and so it was very easily decided that those would be the tools that we would use. However, at that time, um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, we, we didn't have any dental-specific checklists available to us. So uh, the team did quite a bit of research and investigated, and, and we, it was finally decided upon that we would uh, use IPAC Canada's audit tools that were specific to dental clinics, um, as well as dental reprocessing. Um, and then um, the other challenge was really ensuring the clear communications with the clinical services teams. And again, that emphasis that this wasn't meant to be punitive. Um, this isn't meant to come down on them. This is meant for us to all work together and to help each other um, and, and help make um, Hamilton Public Health sort of an example for the community. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jane Lee, um, who's going to speak a little bit about um, the initial thoughts from the um, health inspector perspective.
Hi. <clears throat> so this part of the talk really applies to both audits and IPAC lapse investigations in general. Uh, a lot of the information um, will mirror or may be repetitive to some things already presented by Jen, but we felt it was really important to provide the experience um, from the frontline staff point of view, especially maybe to be beneficial to those public health units that are in the early stages of development and implementation of their own IPAC labs investigation process. Hopefully our experience will help um, them to understand the concerns of frontline staff as well as maybe provide some ways that they can help support um, their staff. So um, as a PHI, uh, initial thoughts from our perspective. Um, I think I can't speak for anybody else. Um, most of the people I know are public health inspectors. So just in terms of speaking with public health inspectors in our own health unit as well as others, when this protocol first came out, I think we all knew that this was a big change regarding the scope of our, our work. So, and with any change comes kind of apprehension, the fear of the unknown, right? So uh, regulated health professionals um, were now a part of that protocol and it was not really um, under our scope um, during our regular work. Uh, for the most part, we offered a referral service. So if someone called in with a complaint about a regulated health professional, we would refer the complaint or refer the complainant onto the um, regulated health body, okay? So, um, and then when we think about the sheer number and diversity of facilities, community um, as well as clinical settings, like you have family health, uh, respirologists, chiropractors, you know, um, doctors who do um, minor surgical procedures in their office, even lab services, dentists, the settings are just overwhelming, like the number of different settings you could be going into with unfamiliar environments, procedures, equipment, and because this was not um, a regular part of our work, it was not covered in our formal education and training as certified PHIs. So <clears throat> I think um, um, we saw um, when this first came out that some health units did have a, a lot of influx of calls. Hamilton was really, really lucky in that we did not see a high volume of calls or demand regarding complaints. And so I feel like we had the luxury of time, right? So we had the time to ask for volunteers. So people who had a high interest in this topic uh, and motivation to expand their IPAC skills and knowledge, as well as with the decision to do that introspective look at our own clinical services, we had that time to do that and have that educational opportunity to get a feel for those kinds of settings. Um, with regards to the audit, I think Jen already um, covered a lot of that, um, but I did want to speak a little bit about, um, as an inspector, most of our work is basically from the outside looking in. So when we're looking at IPAC, we're looking at um, people are meeting, you know, are they doing infection control measures? Are they meeting best standards? We're not the ones actually implementing any of those infection control measures. When we think of regulated health professionals, we're thinking they're doing IPAC every day in their daily work. So we think that they probably have the same amount of IPAC knowledge as, as us, if not higher. So that was our expectation going into the audits, going into our, uh, our um, IPAC lapse uh, investigations at this point. So uh, I think Jen also talked a lot about this already, um, advantages uh, of using um, public health inspectors. So obviously for our audits, um, public health inspectors already have, already do inspections and audits are very similar to inspections. And then for IPAC labs, because I know every health unit is structured differently, but in Hamilton, um, PSS inspections, doing the routine inspections, as well as complaint investigations, was already part of our portfolio as IPAC PHIs. So it was just a natural fit that we would be the ones doing IPAC labs investigations, and we would also be the ones doing those internal audits. Uh, the real um, advantage of using certified PHIs is that because we're used to going into the field and doing inspections, 
we go in cold. We don't make appointments. We just show up at the door. And although we might have sort of an idea of what's going on, like what services are there, what processes might be offered there, you don't really know what you're going to get when you walk in the door, right? Not every office, not every restaurant, not everything is set up exactly the same. They're not cookie cutter. They don't offer all the same services. And I'm sure every public health inspector can tell you about a time they walked in expecting something and finding something totally different, right? Um, people often start serving things or offering services without letting us know. And if they're a higher risk service, then obviously that can become a problem. So although in the last slide I talked about a little bit about apprehension regarding, um, you know, something new, not being familiar with settings, processes, and equipment, generally touched on this that as public health inspectors, we are very familiar with performing risk assessments. So yes, I do think any public health inspector can go into any setting and be able to do that risk assessment, no problem. Ask, what is this used for? You know, how are you cleaning and disinfecting it? That kind of thing. I, I do think anybody um, can do that, but with that comes, you know, you, you kind of want to know what the answer is before you get in there. So it's more like we wanted to be prepared. We wanted to know the answer before we went in there. Um, but if we encounter something we are not sure of, we would be fully confident that we would be able to do the risk assessment and figure out what needs to be done. Um, and then she also talked about so experience dealing in, with difficult situations and communication skills, those kind of go hand in hand. So as she said, regulated health professionals are not used to people coming in. Their regulatory bodies don't come in on a regular basis to do inspections. Um, you know, unlike childcare and our long-term care, which have people coming in expecting them to meet certain standards, um, you don't see that. So. <laughs> A lot of the times they might be wondering like um, what your authority is, why you're there, that kind of thing. And there really is a need for us to be able to explain that um, properly, um, you know, why we're there and basically what your findings are and if there's any requirements, what they need to re remedy or what they need to do in order to um, prevent um, any issues in the future. Um, and also, oh, observation skills. So obviously this is also, um, you know, when you're doing inspections. <laughs> so um, oftentimes you'll know that the inspectors get very good about observing things out of the corner of their eye while they're doing something else. So you can observe that food handler handling that food while you're looking at shelves. Or you can watch that staff member empty their smoothie into the hand wash sink and rinse out the cup while you're talking and interviewing someone else. So that is an essential part um, of doing these inspections and complaint investigations and obviously the audit as well. So we really found that the team approach um, really worked in, in audits, and so we carried that forward into our IPAC labs investigations. And each um, team member did bring their individual strengths and pers uh, perspectives. Um, as Jen said, we did have advantage of having ICT with clinical background and experience, so she already knew um, that some of the procedures, was able to explain the process to us, and um, already know um, what should be done. Um, it was very efficient because if you've looked through the checklist, it's like 30 pages plus. It cites different documents for each requirement and the lear learning curve was very, very large. So we had a very short time period to do these audits. So in order to memorize, you know, however many lengthy documents to know all the requirements was really not realistic. So this team approach where everybody kind of has a lot of information learned, but everybody remembers different content um, and info, was really helpful to be able to troubleshoot as a team. So um, we just want to talk a little bit about internal audits. So because this wasn't a uh, complaint investigation, um, it was supposed to be beneficial to both of us, we divided the audit process into two clinic visits. So the first one was uh, a prearranged pre-clinic visit audit, 
um, where we had a representative from that team or that clinic uh, meet uh, the IPAC team there. And we did an observational tour and a question and answer. So we were looking at things like cleaning, um, products, you know, storage, everything we could look at that wasn't involved in um, probably process, right, um, for services. And obviously, we only have the perspective of the one representative, which may not be representative of all the staff who work in the clinic. So in that way, we did return to the clinic during operate, operating hours, and we did more observational and um, interviewed all the staff that worked there regarding, you know, their infection control procedures. So we compared clinic activities to best practice, and then the results and recommendations were brought forward and reviewed with the manager and the AMOH. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to Crystal now. Okay, thanks, Jane. Um, so unexpected results from the internal audit. There were definitely a few. So as Jane previously mentioned, prior to completion of the audits, we had the assumption that IPAC knowledge uh, would be high amongst clinics, clinic staff. So it was actually surprising to find that there was a knowledge gap in IPAC practices. So for example, like the cleaning step prior to disinfection, uh, when to use alcohol-based hand rub versus when to wash your hands with soap and water. So things like that, um, we actually had to explain, which, which was surprising to us because it's things that we, um, that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, as well, as IPAC PHIs, we're very familiar with PIDEC best practices documents. So we were actually surprised that some staff weren't familiar with them or didn't even know that they existed. So uh, when we actually gave our recommendations, we really had to help them out with, um, with assistance in regards to interpretation of the recommendations, and we really had to break down uh, what certain things meant within those best practices documents. We also found that there was missing or outdated policies and procedures uh, within our own health units. So um, going out in the community, it's pretty common, but within our, within our own health unit, they were missing or outdated, um, which can result in inconsistencies among staff. So audit barriers. There were definitely also a few barriers. Uh, during completion of the audits, we actually came across a lot of issues that were occupational health and safety related. So um, they weren't entirely IPAC related, and we would identify them, but we wouldn't necessarily know the answer and how to solve, solve the issue that we found, because we're not familiar with that legislation. It's something that we're not used to dealing with, so we really found that to be a barrier because the clinic staff really expected us to, to, have, to have the answers, right? They expected us to know everything, and uh, you know they wanted to, to rectify everything immediately. So we found that to be a barrier because, again, we, you know, we're not familiar with, um, with all legislation. Uh, we were also unfamiliar with clinical tools and procedures because, you know, we've all been to the dentist, but do we actually know what everything is? So we really had a lot of questions for the clinic staff in regards to tools and procedures because we really wanted to have a strong understanding of it, but we didn't prior to going in. So again, you know, we really had to have staff break it down for us and explain what this tool did and exactly what um, a certain procedure entailed. And um, we actually had one clinic that didn't allow us to observe um, their staff in actual um, practice due to privacy concerns. So we weren't actually able to properly assess their IPAC practices. So again, it's that whole idea of theory versus practice. So someone can say that they're doing uh, things a certain way, but are they? So it's really, really useful to observe um, because again, you know, you can say that you're doing things one way, but in practice you might be doing it another way. So that was a barrier for that one clinic because we weren't actually able to properly assess um, their IPAC practices due to that privacy concern. So room for improvement. So moving forward, what can we improve? Well, the IPAC audit team really does require ongoing education and resources beyond best practice documents. It's not enough just to simply read. 
You need to go above and beyond that. So you really need to take every opportunity to further develop your IPAC skills. So whether it's, you know, completing your CSA, your MDRAO course, um, obtaining a CIC, it's really taking every single opportunity that you can to expand your IPAC knowledge because reading the documents is not enough. And you really need to get that hands-on experience as well. You also need to know that resources do not translate to actual practice. So not every clinic is set up the same. Um, it's not going to be, you know, the exact same thing that you see um, when you go into different places. And not everything is black and white. So it's really important to be flexible and assess the risk. So if it's critical, yes, you need to, um, you know, rectify it immediately. But if it's non-critical, you can have a little bit more uh, flexibility. As well, uh, as previously mentioned, we actually encountered a lot of issues that were occupational health and safety related. So, you know, it would have been really helpful to have had um, our IPAC audit team include an occupational health and safety staff member. So that way that staff member could have actually answered staff's questions, um, you know, right there on the spot, or they could have actually, you know, been able to interpret the legislation for us. So, um, so that's definitely more room for improvement. It's also good to recruit clinical staff as a resource. So it's good to have a main point person who can explain those tools and those procedures. As well, um, during our audits, we, we would go through, but after the fact, we actually ended up having some questions. So it's really good to have that main point person so that way we can go back and ask them that question and that person can explain things. And then as well for uh, you know community IPAC classes, it's also good to have that clinic staff point person who can, you know, explain what certain things are. Um, as previously mentioned, too, it's also useful to observe procedures because, again, it's the whole idea of theory versus practice. So what one person does uh, or says that they do might not be what they actually do um, during the actual uh, clinic. So moving on to IPAC labs complaints. Uh, just like most health units to date, um, we've, uh, at Hamilton Public Health Services, we've investigated uh, many complaints in several different settings, uh, which include chiropractor, physiotherapist office, an ophthalmologist, dentist, uh, many dentists, uh, family physician with a skin clinic, as well as a home-based tattoo operation. So with the IPAC uh, internal audits, how did we, how was this knowledge to practice? So our internal audits really provided a foundation for the investigation of community IPAC lab complaints. So it increased our knowledge and familiarity with clinical procedures, especially in regards to dental and then um, being able to see our own health unit central reprocessing. So that was really helpful because we were actually able to see certain things and uh, it really increased our knowledge and familiarity in regards to, um, like I said, um, clinic settings, especially dental and reprocessing. It also allowed for the ability to observe and handle clinical equipment and tools, which again, you know, um, you know, prior to completing these audits, did I know what a burr block was? No, I didn't. So, um, you know, it really, really helped us out to be able to handle and observe those tools prior to going out and doing our community IPAC lapses. Um, and again, you know, uh, being familiar with the procedures with the tools. It also allowed for learning, including interviewing staff without the stress and pressure of a complaint investigation. So we all know that I, community IPAC labs complaints are stressful. Okay, so you know you're dealing with regulated health professionals that you know before before I used to just forward on the complaint, but now you're actually having to to deal with the complaint and potentially close them too. So uh, it really allowed for learning, so that way we knew exactly what questions to ask, and we were able to um, you know to to know um, you know what's important, what's not, do the risk assessment, that sort of. Um, those sorts of things. So it also formed realistic expectations around IPAC knowledge. So, you know, a common theme uh, throughout this entire uh, presentation is that we had the assumption that IPAC knowledge, you know, was really high. But um, after completion of these audits, we actually, you know, realized that, no, not everybody has that basic IPAC knowledge. So sometimes you do have to break things down and you might have to help them out with interpretation. Um, of, you know, best practices documents. So, you know, again, it made us realize that not everyone is on the same level. 
Uh, overall, it increased our confidence and which led to greater inspection presence. So, you know, again, uh, we all know being inspectors that it's all about your confidence. You know, if you go in there and you're, you know, not sure, well, you know what, the, the operator is going to pick up on that. So um, these IPAC audits really, really uh, helped us out in regards to the confidence of investigation of community IPAC lab complaints. So overall, I'd say that the IPAC audits were a two-way knowledge exchange. Uh, the clinics improved their IPAC practices. Well, we actually learned uh, what to potentially expect during community IPAC lapses. So now I'm going to hand it back to Jen for takeaways and future considerations. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so one of the key takeaways, even though we, we did discuss um, some sort of the issues that we came into the audit, I, I should make clear uh, that our clinics were actually doing a pretty good job um, and we had no reason um, to actually even um, consider that there was a lapse going on. Um, but I think um, what we were saying was sort of some of the detail and when you get into the everyday work um, and if you're not um, looking at IPAC documents every single day, um, you can kind of lose some of the perspective on, on things or, or, you know, there's always changes and, and new things and PIDAC's always changing, et cetera. And so those were some of the, the challenges that we ran into. But, but overall, we were um, quite pleased um, that we, uh, we had nothing to um, be embarrassed about um, or anything that we needed to post um, or, or have uh, questionable in, in the work that we were doing in our clinics. So that was a real positive that came out of this. Um, so it was... Um, some of the key takeaways I have in terms of sort of managing the program and, and taking it on was um, it was really important to validate any concerns and apprehension from the IPAC investigators. Um, it really um, didn't do anything, we wouldn't do anything for anyone if we just threw people into this um, and didn't address those concerns and, and I think um, it, it would really put us at a disadvantage as a, as a health unit. Um, and, and that the team effort is vital, um, which I think Crystal and Jean spoke to. Um, that was actually very, very important. And when I speak of team, is even within our own team, but also with our clinical services folks. Um, that, that was huge. Um, and, and their help was uh, greatly appreciated. And, and I would assume hopefully vice, vice versa. Um, and, um, and that we maintain continual communications with our clinical services teams, which is something that we have seen now. We, we completed the audits in the end of 2016, and so um, we have been doing continual communications. I get emails every so often asking questions for clarification on PIDAC documents, and I think that's been a really positive outcome, is that they're really looking at these things and, and considering them on a regular basis um, and, and much more conscious um, of what's happening, and that's really good to see. Um, and it's also broken down some of the departmental silos, and, and I've spoken with some other health units, and they agreed, and this can happen. Um, we all work on our own little spaces, and we do our own thing, and, um, and we don't always realize what the other person is doing. The left hand isn't always talking to the right hand. And so this uh, effort is really, we got to know some people that we never knew. You know, you see them in the elevator, but you don't know what they do. So we really got to know some people and make some friends um, across the department. And... Um, and really, um, that preparation and capacity building is an ongoing process. So we did these audits, we did this training. It's not over. Um, it's far from over. So um, what's to come? Um, for our team, um, all of our team members are going to be participating in these IPAC labs complaints. So not just the, the five that we have now. Um, but we, will, we are going to have everyone, hopefully by the end of this year, um, functioning and being able to respond to these complaints. Um, we are doing increasing education of all the ID PHIs um, around IPAC. Um, so a number of folks have taken the CSA, some CSA reprocessing courses. Um, people are interested in taking the MDRAO course. Um, and we actually have a study group going on with all of our PHIs that's going on at the moment um, where we're doing training for CIC, um, so getting certification in infection control. And so the expectation isn't that everyone gets certified, but we would like um, a few members um, of our team getting certified and, and then also just providing that basic education that the CIC uh, can do. And so uh, we're using some um, information that was shared with us from PHO uh, a number of years back, and we're using that as our study guide. <laughs> And we're also doing a departmental review of resources, and that's always an ongoing issue in Health Unit. Um, we're always reviewing our resources, where we can land things. 
right now, um, as we mentioned, Hamilton, we had it pretty quiet in 2016. We only had a handful um, of IPAC complaints. 2017 was much busier, um, and we had uh, three postings that we had to do, IPAC laps postings, and we got a number of complaints, and we expect that to keep increasing. And so how is that going to reflect on the workloads? Because that hasn't really changed for the for the PHIs other than, um, you know, we took away some of those reportable diseases. So, you know, looking at the resources that we have. Challenges ahead, there are many. Um, again, seeing that increasing number of complaints, that's a given, um, and that's going to keep happening. Um, and with every time um, these lapses hit the media, which we've seen quite a few um, in 2017, uh, we see an increase in, in our complaints, and people become more aware in the public that they can make these complaints. So that is going to be a challenge. Um, increasing um, complexity in the nature of the complaints, um, so we're getting a lot more detailed. Um, you know, sometimes we're getting, not to, to, you know, rat anyone out, but sometimes we're getting complaints from people who are actually working in these clinics, and so it gets much more involved um, because they know what's going on behind the scenes, and so they become more complex. And again, that increasing workload, um, it's a lot of work to respond to an IPAC lapse complaint, as I'm sure anyone uh, listening who, who's responded to one, and uh, not just the preparation and the going in, but the aftermath um, of everything that happens. Um, legal challenges, we're seeing those coming out, um, unfortunately, and so that is a concern, and now are we going to um, address that and, and avoid those um, as much as we possibly can? And so that is something that we're often thinking about um, and the risk um, to, to the corporation as well as the risk to the public when we, we don't want to be afraid um, to be able to do these uh, complaints and respond to them in an appropriate manner. And um, inconsistencies in approaches across the province. Uh, that's, that's a typical complaint, um, I think, um, in public health units across Ontario, is that we all sort of approach things a little bit differently. And so I do think um, one of the challenges that we really need to address full on as a province is how are we going to become more consistent? How are we going to do this work more consistently? Um, because I think that gives us more credibility, um, and I think it improves our ability to do our work. Um, and uh, the reputation of um, a certified public health inspector in the profession. Um, and so, you know, that can get called into question sometimes with these investigations. And so um, I do think that there is a role there for the for, the, for sci-fi, um, for the inspectors. Um, and, and I think we're doing a really good job of it so far, especially with what happened this past fall, um, and really uh, emphasizing uh, the reputation and the skills um, and the expertise of inspectors in doing this work. Um, and that's, that's a huge, a huge thing. And capacity building uh, within the inspector profession. Um, again, this doesn't come naturally. Um, this does take a lot of training, um, a lot of research, a lot of work, um, and um, and so that is something that we really need to look at, probably province-wide uh, with inspectors, is building that capacity. Um, and so um, we are going to be continually uh, doing that within our own health unit. Um, and so I meant to mention in an earlier slide, and um, I think a question popped up about this, is that we are doing these audits regularly now. Um, and so what's happening in the city of Hamilton is that we'll be doing these audits on a, a rotating basis. So we'll be picking one or two clinics per year um, and doing these um, every three years, each clinic every three years. But there is an expectation from leadership in the health unit um, that each clinic and each team will be doing their own internal, their own audits of themselves uh, on an annual, at least an annual basis, and that IPAC education is a part of their regular work um, uh, every every so often. So we will be continuing to do these audits, and these will also help us in, in building further capacity. It's also going to help us to expand the more inspectors that will be able um, to do this work. So um, that's it for the presentation. So um, thanks to everyone uh, for listening in today. And just want to acknowledge uh, Deborah Marcillo, one of our inspectors on the team. She's one of the third inspector that helped to do these audits, as well as Janice Fackelman, our nurse practitioner and ICP, um, the ID team. Um, and of course, the clinical services teams at Hamilton Public Health Services, they're wonderful um, and uh, really helped us out. And um, we're very very open, um, you know, to us coming in and doing this work, which could be um, kind of awkward at times, and uh, as well as to Jordan Walker, the manager of the ID team, and to our uh, former uh, associate medical officer of health, Dr. Hopkins, um, who really helped us through this whole process. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much to our, our three presenters today for, for really sharing your experience, especially from the PHI 
perspective, um, but also being quite candid with your with your thoughts and your your perspectives on that. So thank you so much. So at this point, we are going to open it up for um, for questions. Um, and so as I'm kind of navigating this space, I thought perhaps I could um, ask a quick question myself, if you don't mind. So you've provided a lot of uh, really good takeaways from your presentation and from your experience. Um, but if you were to kind of boil it down into a key piece of advice for health units to consider doing internal audits of themselves, what would that advice be? Um, okay, I guess I could speak to that. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I had, and this is more coming, I guess, from um, sort of the management of the program perspective, um, but the biggest piece of advice is communications um, and very clear communications in terms of what these audits mean, um, what they are, and what they're not, um, which is maybe a bigger part of it. Um, and so that was a huge component for me when I was preparing for this and, and doing this work, was making sure that I was able to speak to almost every single staff member in each of these clinics. Um, I would attend team meetings. And um, you know, I would I would explain what these were, that it wasn't punitive, um, and that we were coming in to just take a look and help and et cetera, explain the reasoning behind it, um, explain the new legislation, which many folks weren't aware of, um, as it's not their their area of public health, and um, and also allowing them the time to ask the questions and to sit back and ask me as many questions as they wanted, um, and as well as to feel free to ask the team as many questions as they wanted uh, coming out of it, and that this communication doesn't end. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't end with the end of the audit and that it continues um, throughout the process um, and that we, uh, we're continually in communications with each other and, uh, and assisting each other. So again, that's sort of the biggest piece of advice I would guess if, some, if a health unit is going to undertake these is to make sure that communications is really very, very clear um, and when they're doing these and taking it on. Great, thank you. So at this time, I'm going to kind of balance between the room, if there's any questions in the room, as well as what's happening on uh, the chat. So uh, just kind of going in order here, there's a few logistics uh, pieces here, um, and asking if the slides will be available, and they will be become available for you. Um, and so uh, one of the questions here is, are random audits done? So I believe you kind of addressed that a little bit, but um, do you have anything further to add in terms of a random audit? Um, depending on what your definition of random is, um, no, we're, we're not doing random audits. Um, so these are pre-booked and, and, um, and we do that. And that's just, um, again, being collegial and, um, and we're not trying to be punitive. We're not trying to catch people out. Um, uh, we're just trying to be there to work together and, and to improve things. Um, so we don't uh, do any, any random audits uh, per se, um, but they are planned. So when we go in to do them. So again, these aren't investigations. Um, these are audits that we're going in. So I guess the answer is know uh, overall for that. <laughs> um, another question here that we have is, do you think that the audits brought some changes to the IPAC principles in these clinics? Um, so maybe now are they doing things differently? Oh yeah, no question. Um, absolutely. And um, and I think as I mentioned earlier, um, the communications, which I've talked about quite a bit, has really opened up. Um, and uh, you know, and I've gotten to know the teams. Like I really didn't know a lot of these folks before. Um, I was on my own little silo on the ID side. And so um, the communications has really opened up. And so we're really talking a lot. Um, you know, I was just getting emails yesterday asking about biohazardous waste, um, et cetera. And so um, having some specific questions. And, um, and uh, there's a lot more awareness um, and knowledge and a lot more interest, I think, as well um, from, from the teams in terms of uh, what the latest is and what's going on um, around IPAC. hope that answered the question. Yeah, a question in-house, yeah. Are these mics on? I believe so, yeah. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Jen, Jane, and Crystal for their presentation. Uh, my name is Eric Devine. I'm a uh, former PHI and I work uh, as an uh, ICP for UHN. And I think that I have several comments, but I'll try and keep it brief. Um, your title, Uncharted Territory, um, it may be uncharted for the health unit, but know that you have lots of partners, um, some of them PHIs that work in acute care, um, ambulatory settings, that have a lot of knowledge and experience. And this is the kind of thing that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So. You know, up the street here in Hospital Row, all of these hospitals have clinics. They have dental clinics. They have ophthalmology clinics. They have similar settings to what you have. 
Um, and the professionals that work in those environments are an excellent resource. They would love to have people to reach out to them, to have a conversation. Um, you know, the way that PHIs get passionate about the work that they do, the, the same way that ICPs do. We love to talk about the work that we do. So and I would encourage any of the health units out there that if they're interested in, 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 in bridging the gap a little bit and, and filling in some of the knowledge gaps, would be to talk to the ICPs. They can provide you with um, excellent resources. Um, the Canadian Standards Associations, um, ambulatory clinics, documents, uh, healthcare facility design, all of those are available and there's a list of, they have contacts all over the place. So it's great the work that you're doing, but know that you're not alone. <laughs> Oh, thanks so much. That's really appreciated, that comment. Um, and uh, and that would be great. And it really is, like, uh, you know, as you were talking, that was sort of occurring to me that that would really be a great resource for us to maybe uh, connect with as, a, as an organization, whether it be sci-fi um, or health inspectors as well, in terms of some sort of collaboration or working together, um, consultations that we can do uh, in working. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's lots of inspectors out there working in ICP. And, and for us in the health unit, yeah, this absolutely was uncharted territory. But uh, But it's nice to know that you are out there. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, continuing to go down the, the line of questions from online, um, there is a, a question here saying, uh, any thoughts about creating a working group of sorts at Sci-Fi for IPAC lapses? So um, truthfully, I, I don't think we're all here necessarily uh, able to kind of address that, but some of the thoughts that I have just off the top of my head is that Sci-Fi does have the Infectious Disease Working Group, which is a committee, um, a, a working group under Sci-Fi, and uh, both uh, Jen and I are both, are both on that committee, and so perhaps that's something that we can table at that group too to see if uh, how that could work uh, into that. So I think that's a really interesting concept, just kind of PHI to PHI talking about um, kind of gaps or support that we could provide each other. So uh, thank you, uh, Middlesex London, for that question. Um, so a lot of, I'm kind of skipping over, and I apologize, but there's a lot of very positive thoughts throughout. If you can't see them, there's a really interesting thing. So uh, really good uh, positive feedback from here. Um, so uh, Blake also has a question here uh, for you. It says, have you observed uh, an increase in participation from colleges or associations of health professionals? Some health professional organizations uh, develop their own guidance documents for practices, such as autoclave use or specific procedures. Um, and do you incorporate any internally developed guidance documents for procedures from professional bodies or strictly use PIDAC? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, as to the last part of it, um, incorporating um, that, uh, we, we mainly just use PIDAC because um, that's kind of our be all end all um, for IPAC. But um, when we were preparing for these audits and doing a lot of this research, we also felt it was important to look at documents uh, from the professional bodies. Um, so um, with dentistry, we looked at some documents from Alberta, um, from the college. We looked at the RCDSO's documents around IPAC. So um, we've definitely considered um, those other bodies and their documents and what they have. They're, they're absolutely. And uh, we refer to them on a, on a regular basis, um, and including CSA, obviously, for reprocessing. Um, we look at a lot of that. So. Um, but for when we do these kind of things, it's, it's mostly about PIDAC and we're looking at best practice. Um, obviously, that's what we sort of go with. Um, as for, I think the first part was increase in participation. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I think we can see an increase in participation when things get, you know, out into the media. Um, people become a little bit more interested. Um, and so we have in Hamilton um, seen um, some participation and interest. Um, and in uh, the summer, this past summer, we got a call from our local uh, dental academy um, who um, there had been some uh, interesting news about some dental practices in, in Halton and Guelph uh, around that time. And so they contacted us in a a slight maybe panic um, and worried about this and so they really reached out um, and requested that we come out and do a presentation and, and work with them and uh, and so we did and, and PHO was kind enough, Dr. Cividino came out and, and uh, uh, Donna Moore um, and as well as uh, Dr. Chris Swayze which was great from the Royal College and so we did that presentation and, and um, it really got a lot of really good messages out and we heard a lot from the community which I think is important. Again, there's that communications component. Um, we heard a lot from the community and, and what their concerns were and that helps us to form uh, what we're doing, as well as our uh, local Hamilton Family Health team. They've had a lot of interest in this and are asking for presentations and further education on uh, IPAC and IPAC lapses and, and what's involved in that. 
That's great. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. So uh, hopefully we can uh, continue to answer these questions in uh, a quick fashion here before we go. Uh, so one of the ones here is, uh, do we have any uh, resources available in terms of legal advice specific to these topics? Um, pretty short answer. Uh, no, I don't really have access to anything. Uh, we just use our legal team um, in Hamilton when we feel the need to. Great, thank you. And uh, another question from uh, what I believe is Leeds is, do you notify healthcare providers when following up on a complaint before you go in? So obviously that's the iPad complaint component. Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and that comes up a lot. And I know it's been discussed in the IPAC uh, working group um, in, the, in the, with the province. Um, we do and we don't. It depends on the situation, so it's case by case. Um, so depending on, uh, most of the time we do try and call, but we would never uh, give the nature um, of the complaint. Um, and we would just say, uh, we need to come out and see you. And I think they get the idea. Uh, of what it's about, but we would never say what the complaint was until we actually get there. Um, but sometimes, again, depending on the situation, it's case by case, and so we evaluate each complaint. That's great. Yeah, Eric? Sorry, just one last comment that uh, I see an opportunity for public health units. The way that you do um, food premises blueprint inspection, I think there's an opportunity um, to do the same thing with clinic settings. Um, in my experience, been, because I focus on construction and design in the work that I do, is that one of the most substantial and significant impacts to disease transmission, I mean significant from a statistical uh, perspective, is the design of the physical environment. So if somehow you could incorporate design before these clinics open, you're already ahead of the game. Um, and you yeah. have experience doing blueprint review with food premises. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and that would be fantastic. Um, and we've had this discussion of, you know, oh, if only we could tell them to put a wall up here. Um, but um, but I, that might be something actually for us to approach the regulated health uh, bodies, uh, the regulatory bodies about, and, and whether they can, you know, encourage that. Um, we can't enforce that, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but if we can encourage that, that would be uh, a great idea. It's a really good idea. And a couple last questions here that hopefully we can sneak in. Um, but from North Bay is, what is the role of regulated, regulated health bodies ever since health units have taken over the task? Um, well, I think it's, it's outlined um, fairly clearly in the, um, in the protocol and in the, the guidance document, um, the role. But we have had a lot of interaction with the different regulated health bodies. Um, and, um, and they've come out with us um, at times and requested. And so they will come out. Um, and so, and so we do try and uh, work together as much as we can, even though we do have um, slightly different roles. But, um, but they they are definitely participating. And as I said, they've come out to do uh, presentations, and they've participated as well as the associations, like for instance, the Ontario Dental Association. And so uh, I think we will just ask that uh, this be the last question uh, that we sneak in here, and it's from uh, Tanya from York, is when your investigation is completed and you close the loop, or to close the loop, do you communicate your findings and recommendations to the complainant at a high level or very detailed? Um, so when our complaint is done, uh, we actually give them a copy of the report that we filled out. So um, we've actually created a hedgehog um, inspection um, form um, that is um, exactly the same as the PHO sort of checklist. But we'll often give them a copy of the PHO checklist because it has really good links to the documents that each category is referring to. And then um, we'll also give them um, the hedgehog report uh, that details everything that either we require or recommend, et cetera. Complainant. Oh, the complainant. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, uh, we give them a general um, feedback. Uh, yeah, we would we would tell them exactly sort of what happened and what we found um, while still respecting um, some of the privacy potentially of, uh, of the person that we investigated. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. Great. I think uh, just given the time, I think we'll wrap up the call. So um, again, I would just really like to thank everybody on the webinar uh, who joined us today as well as uh, in-house. Um, it's been a great um, conversation and really good participation with everybody. So uh, again, a specific thank you to Jennifer, uh, Crystal, and Jane for your presentation and sharing your experience. So uh, a couple last minute housekeeping things is we just like to ask you to reflect on how this information that you heard today, uh, you know, might be able to use, you might be able to take it away and use it in your own practice. Um, and then also in 
in line with that, uh, please do ensure that you complete the evaluation form on the session because it really does help us uh, inform these sessions going forward. And then finally, uh, we just want to put in a plug for the next seminar series. So stay tuned for the next one, which is Rabies is Real, an Innovative Approach to Rabies Awareness. And that's taking place on Wednesday, February 14th, and it's presented by Jane Murrow. So again, thank you to everybody for their participation and involvement, and have a great day.